ladies also? OK. So, so let, let's go again. I, I was asked there at the break, at, um, was it, hang on, let me see, here. I was asked about this again. And so what happens? Does, the, does H plus O2 take over? Does, it was clear to me there was a little bit of confusion. Okay, and I haven't maybe clearly explained it. Okay, so you can see very obviously here that there's a change in behavior of the fuels occurring. Okay, and so there's sort of, sort of a temperature point here, I don't know, inverse temperature 7.75, whatever that is, about 1300 Kelvin or so, where all of the reactivity of the, the mixtures is the same, and then above that temperature, lean mixtures are faster, and rich mixtures are slowest, okay? But below that temperature, the opposite is true. Rich mixtures are fastest, and lean mixtures are slowest. So why, why is that happening, okay? And I just want to try and explain that as best I can again. And it, this, I think, does go back to this concept of ceiling temperature, all right? So if we're depending on the pressure, so at this condition, I forget, I should have looked at the, it's 30 atmospheres. So at that condition, this turnover is occurring at 1300 Kelvin, okay, the ceiling temperature, okay? But, so below that ceiling temperature, we're still getting some RO2, okay? And if we go back to this slide, okay, so we do get R, and even below 1300 Kelvin, in that propyl benzene example that I was giving you. A lot of the propyl benzene radicals, the daughter radicals, are undergoing beta decision. But they still do have the option to add to molecular oxygen, okay? Some of them still do. And we still do get some um, propyl benzyl peroxy radicals. And those radicals then are generating an olefinic species plus HO2. So we're getting a concerted elimination. This really doesn't go on anyplace else, mostly, except to an olefin plus HO2 in, in that temperature range. So we're, we're getting some production of HO2 through this pathway up to the ceiling temperature. And that HO2 is then abstracting a hydrogen atom from a stable molecule, mostly the fuel, but other stable species in the system, generating H2O2, hydrogen peroxide, and then decomposing to give two hydroxy radicals and giving us chain branching, all right? And hence, but the concentration of HO2 that's formed, you can see, will be then proportional to the concentration of RO2, which will be proportional to the concentration of fuel radicals, which will be proportional to the concentration of the fuel. Higher the concentration of the fuel, the faster the system will be. Right? So below, below the ceiling temperature, the more fuel you have in the system, the faster the reactivity. At intermediate temperatures, due to the formation, the proportional formation of HO2, and at low temperatures, due to the proportional formation of OH radicals. Okay? Hopefully that clarifies things for everybody. All right? And that's why... So not only in the low temperature region, but even in this intermediate temperature region where you're, you know, you're above, we don't see any NTC rage, uh, behavior here for isopentanol um, because these are ignition delay times measured in a shock tube. You will see them at lower temperature here. There'll be some sort of a turnover and so on. But you can see here, even here, rich mixtures are faster, lean mixtures are slower. But we're not getting a lot of um, alkyl peroxy radicals, isomerizing to hydroperoxy radicals, adding to molecular oxygen, going through the keto hydroperoxide and forming two OH radicals. We're gone beyond that. We're out of the NTC region, but we're still rich mixtures are faster, lean mixtures are slower. Okay? And that's because we're below this, the ceiling temperature is being approached here, you can see, but we're below the ceiling temperature and the fuel radicals are leading to the formation proportionately of HO2, which will then increase the reactivity. Okay. So that's 
And that sort of brings us to the next slide that you have in your thing. So this is just showing you then the ignition of propane in a closed adiabatic system. And what the pressure, or the, well, in this case, temperature time history would look like when you simulate um, an alkane oxidation at different temperatures. So here, the initial temperature is 600 Kelvin. Again, this is arbitrary time units. But you can see that the ignition, um, we get a first stage ignition followed by, by a very closely followed by a second stage ignition. Why is that? OK? And again, you know, for, for a lot of time, we get very little reactivity. Then we get the sharp increase. Then it sort of, well, not plateaus, but stops. You know, there's a very, there is a defined difference here and here. So this is, we're getting a two-stage ignition event. Okay. So this first event, with a, a large amount of heat release, stems from the fact that the keto hydroperoxides start to break. That OO bond starts to cleave, and now we get our chain branching mechanism occurring. Because up to that point, we're only getting one OH released. That OH reacts with the fuel, generating water, and we're getting heat release a little bit, OK, in that propagation. And that heat release is allowing the temperature to increase very, very slightly. And you see it sort of feeds back, feedback loop. Temperature goes up a little bit and starts going up here, and then all of a sudden, we can get over the threshold of we, we cleave all of a sudden a lot of these OO bonds, and a lot of the keto hydroperoxide that has built up, and that all of those molecules that couldn't overcome the activation energy barrier can now overcome it. They're released into the system. We got lots of OH released into the system, we get lots of OH reacting with stable molecules, mostly the fuel. We get lots of water produced and lots of heat release. And hence, the temperature rises. So that, this is now our glut of keto hydroperoxides that were there have now been used up. The system still isn't able to ignite completely because we have to use up the fuel and so on. So we wait for that to happen. And then we get the second ignition event. But that occurs pretty soon after the first one. OK? Now we go to a higher temperature. It looks like it's about 625 Kelvin here. And the, the system, it looks similar, but the first stage ignition now isn't as pronounced. It's not as steep, it's not as high a step. OK? And then the second stage event takes a bit longer than it did in the first case. Right? Why? Because now we're at a slightly higher temperature. So more of the keto hydroperoxides, there isn't as much of a buildup at 625 Kelvin than there was at 600. <coughs> they are able to, um, some of them, get over the barrier. Okay? We don't get the same buildup that we did at 600 Kelvin. So we don't get a huge step rise, but we still get some. And then we get release, or the second stage ignition, which is the high, all of the high temperature chemistry occurring. It, it's, it's proceeding in temperature, OK? Then we go to something above 650, 675 Kelvin, or 650 Kelvin, maybe. And again, you see the step isn't as great. And it takes almost as long or longer to get to the second stage. And the time scale, the time for ignition, the total ignition time, is about the same at 650 Kelvin compared to 625, OK? So, we have less buildup of keto hydroperoxide, less formation of them. So there's few of them released. We get less heat release in that first stage process. So now there's still more fuel to be consumed in the second stage process. So it's taking longer to get to the second stage. OK? And then above that, we don't see any of the two stage. Well, we do at 675. We see a kind of a small step, but it's now being washed out. And we have, it takes much longer to get to the, the total ignition event. 
because this low temperature chemistry isn't happening very much. We're not getting the production of ketohydroperoxides very much anymore. You can see it because they're not building up and we're not getting that step. Okay? And hopefully that makes sense from what I've been telling you about the, the branching versus propagation and so on. So all of these, we're not getting down at the, in the negative temperature coefficient behavior, our region, we're not getting down to the keto hydroperoxide. The, the, the fuel molecules are going through propagation steps and other reaction steps, which then all those species have to be consumed through conventional or other chemistry to get a total ignition and the buildup of radical pool so that we get ignition. Okay, um, I hope that's pretty clear. Okay, so this is just showing, look, the negative temperature coefficient behavior then, we even get it for propane, okay? But it's very long. You can see here that it, it's about 200 milliseconds we're seeing uh, negative temperature coefficient behavior. Yes? Uh, so I was asked, if we had a heavier hydrocarbon, what would the steps look like? Very similar. This, this system, so this would be the kind of thing you would see for, for most alkanes. Uh, you see similar sort of behavior. Okay, yes? Yes, this only happens, yes. So the question is, this only happens for alkanes with three um, carbon atoms or longer. And, and other molecules, like alcohols and so on, as well. But correct, yes. Okay. So I said that I, I'd show you the slide um, earlier in the previous lecture. So, at, so if we're at high pressure and low temperature then, this is a sensitivity analysis that I, it's probably in my paper, for isooctane, phi is equal to one in air at 40 atmospheres. I just took it out of there. And you can see this is to ignition delay time, okay? And here, here we're looking on, on the right, a reduction in reactivity. At the initial temperature, 725, 825, and 1,000 Kelvin. Now, there's one thing that I want to say, and I, I'll come to it in the end, okay? If I just go back a little bit. You, you can see here, we see a an an negative temperature coefficient behavior, and then we go up to high temperature where we don't see it anymore. And that's for ignition delay time, okay? And then we have this, I have this example of the N-heptane, and here we see NTC behavior at this temperature, and then we go higher in temperature, and this, the shape of the curve and everything, it looks like the same behavior. And it is, but it's a much different progression through chemistry. And what I'm trying to say is that here in this reactor, it's so dilute that you're pretty much at, like you have a half a percent fuel, you know, you've got, I don't know, 95% uh, or more diluent, okay? So you have very little heat release really in this process, okay? So you're at the temperature that, that is depicted here, okay? Whereas an ignition event you start at that temperature, but then you transition up to 12, 1300 Kelvin to ignition. So to simulate the reactor, it, it can be sometimes uh, a little more, more involved simulation in comparison to a shock tube ignition delay time. So um, if you simulate a, a shock tube ignition delay time, you assume, we typically assume constant volume, or at least I do, or my group does, and then we put in the initial temperature, we start at time zero, and we allow the chemistry to evolve in time. And whenever we get ignition, we get ignition. And we plot that ignition time against the initial temperature, okay? But that is only the initial temperature. The chemistry is going from that temperature all the way through the different chemistry regimes to ignition. So when, when we plot and unfortunately, this is a rapid compression machine, but say, anyway, it doesn't matter. We have an ignition delay time here. This ignition delay time is about 700 Kelvin, let's say, right? And, but, and of course, you've got the further complications, the RCM, about heat loss and so on. But regardless, the, the fuel is heated to 700 Kelvin. 
But then on its way to ignition, it goes through 800, 900, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200. And the chemistry at the different regimes is influencing the reactivity as it goes through there. So it's actually very complicated simulation. Okay? And the chemistry is constantly changing inside the system. Okay? So even though the shape of the curve, it gives you an NT negative temperature coefficient regime and so on, it's a very complicated process that it goes through in that system. Whereas for the reactor, it's at 600 Kelvin, and the chemistry that occurs at 600 Kelvin is influencing it. And, and if we raise the temperature, we do see the, still the NTC behavior, and it looks very similar. Okay. Anyway, I hope you understand the message I'm trying to say. Okay, so here for isooctane, I'm, I'm just showing the sensitivity at this condition. And in comparison to the sensitivity plot that, plots that I showed yesterday, where I was talking about the low, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the lower uh, species chemistry at high temperature, now you see big influence to fuel alkyl radical by decision, um, alkyl radical addition to molecular oxygen, O2 QOH decomposition to the keto hydroperoxide plus OH, all the fuel, low temperature chemistry, fuel plus OH, and so on. There is still some, actually, and, and this is true for highly branched alkanes. You see some influence of methyl radical chemistry in there, and methyl peroxy chemistry can be important for the branched alkanes, just, just to, to remember that. Okay, and you see some of those here. And here, H plus O2 plus M and H plus O2 giving you O plus OH, particularly at 1,000 Kelvin because they're begin starting to compete with one another. Okay, but if we look at the lower temperature, particularly at 825 Kelvin, now at 725 and, at, and uh, the bar for bed decision is smaller than it is at 825 and it's actually smallest at 1,000 Kelvin. Okay, which is kind of strange, but you see that really there's a competition here between for alkyl radical beta scission and alkyl radical adding to molecular oxygen to give RO2. And the greatest competition occurs at 825 Kelvin. At 725 Kelvin, the alkyl radical just mainly adds to molecular oxygen, so it's not a, a problem. Okay, and at 1000 Kelvin, the alkyl radical mostly undergoes beta decision. Okay? But at this intermediate temperature, A25 Kelvin, okay, the alkyl radical is, is in competition. It can either beta decision or it can add to molecular oxygen. If it adds to molecular oxygen, we get re high reactivity. If it undergoes beta decision, we reduce reactivity. Okay? But, and then we see sensitivity then to all these other um, reactions too, okay? So we, if, we, if we then want to have an accurate mechanism, we need to know accurately what is the rate of alkyl radical addition to molecular oxygen and also what is the rate of alkyl radical beta decision, okay? So, and what we do is then for the larger alkanes, we apply uh, reaction rate rules because we, we don't, we cannot study all of them in an elementary way, okay? So the high temperature mechanism then, and this slide is courtesy of uh, Bill Pitts at Livermore, um, we have reaction class one, unimolecular fuel decomposition, then followed by hydrogen atom abstraction from the fuel, reaction class three, alkyl radical decomposition, for alkyl radical plus O2 giving us olefin plus HO2, Five, alkyl radical isomerization. Six, hydrogen atom abstraction from olefins, addition of radical species to olefins, and then the alkenyl radical decomposition and olefin decomposition. So these are all included in the high temperature portion of the mechanism. And for all of these reaction classes, then, we apply reaction rate rules to them. Okay, so let's sort of use a test molecule and for the test molecule, we use 4-methylheptane, okay? And here we have this structure, 4-methylheptane. We have uh, a carbon atom here. We haven't depicted the hydrogen atoms. 
Okay, we have a carbon atom here bonded to a carbon atom, so it's only one other carbon. There's three hydrogens, so it's a primary carbon atom. It's bonded to one other carbon. This carbon atom here is bonded to this one and this one, so it's a secondary carbon atom. This one is also bonded to two others, so it's also a secondary. And then this carbon is bonded to three others. It's bonded to this one, this one, and this one, so it's a tertiary carbon atom. Okay, and then the same on the other side. All right. So, but now the bond association energy associated with each hydrogen atom, so the C, this is CH bond strength now, not CC. Okay, so just, just to, you might make a note in your slide there. So a primary, a, so a, a, a CH, a primary CH bond is about 101.5 calocarriers per mole. A secondary CH bond is about 98.5 calocarriers per mole. And the tertiary is about 96.5, or 96. OK. That's important later when we're doing, when we're talking about abstraction in particular, hydrogen atom abstraction. OK. So how about unimolecular fuel decomposition? It's actually very important for ignition delay times in a shock tube. Okay, at around 12, 1300 Kelvin and so on, we see high sensitivity to this reaction um, for ignition delay time predictions. So the high pressure limit is usually estimated in the reverse exothermic direction, radical, radical recombination with no activation energy. So remember a couple of days ago, I was talking about methyl plus methyl recombination. So for methyl plus methyl recombination, we have no activation energy. So we like to look at these reactions in that direction then. So if we, if we consider, just go back, if we consider this molecule then, what we like to do is say, okay, let's cleave a hydrogen atom here, and we have the radical plus H. And if we have the H atom plus the radical, what is the ray constant for that reaction? We have a ray constant. And we typically use 10 to the 14. So H atom plus any radical 10 to the 14. And that's the, the, the collision limit for H atom reacting with something. And then we allow the thermochemistry to decide what the ray constant will be in the other direction, the actual unimolecular decay direction. OK? And then we also include, then we have methyl plus this radical, the, the um, what is it, the C7 species, so methyl plus whatever C7 radical we have. And for methyl addition, we use something like 2 or 3 times 10 to the 13 for the rate constant, for the high pressure limit. And then we allow the thermochemistry to dictate the rate in the unimolecular decomposition direction. And then we have ethyl plus this C6 radical. And then we have uh, N-propyl plus the C5 radical. And we cleave each bond in turn, including each one of the reactions in the reverse direction, radical plus radical recombination, and allowing the code to calculate the unimolecular decomposition from the thermochemistry. Okay, so here I've, I've shown you uh, this radical plus H, giving you back the fuel. We write that as 10 to the 14 um, centimeters cubed per mole per second, and then the unimolecular decay rate is calculated from the thermochemistry. And the, this is based on the recommendation of Alara and Shaw, which was, Shaw, which was published in JFIS Chem reference data in 1980. Okay. And then we have, as I said, we have all the different other reactions that occur, methyl plus 3-methyl-1-hexyl radical forming 4-methyl-heptane. We have a, a rate constant here of about between 1 to 3 times 10 to the 13, or something like that. And we have uh, the ray constant, the reverse direction is calculated from the thermochemistry. OK. Now, one other thing, there, there's an interesting paper. And there's another one on another paper published by the same authors or similar authors on allyl uh, resonantly stabilized radical recombinations, also in 2007. But this is an interesting paper that was published by Stephen Klippenstein and co-authors in Fizz, Chem, Chem, Fizz in 2006, where they, he looked at, and I, uh, 
I could have downloaded, the, well anyway, I, I, I wasn't able to download the paper last night, but one of these lines is actually the actual calculated ray constant um, looking at the combination of methyl plus ethyl or methyl plus isopropyl or methyl plus terbutyl, okay, and so on. And then he, they, there's also a calculated rate constant using the geometric mean rule. So what, what um, the authors did was they calculated using ab initio methods the rate constant for these combinations, KAA uh, with, with the ray constant for the reaction of methyl plus ethyl, okay? But then they were able actually, or, and the, sorry, the self recombination of methyl plus methyl, and ethyl with ethyl, and isopropyl with isopropyl, and terbutyl with terbutyl, okay? And then they said, right, well, what if they, we use the geometric mean rule? And that, this geometric mean rule relates the self combination rate coefficients of two radicals and their cross combination rate coefficients. So the rate constant for methyl with ethyl is actually equal to tri twice the square root of the ray constant of methyl with itself times the ray constant of ethyl with itself, okay? And then they compared the calculated, I, I presume the solid lines here are the calculated, but one of them is either calculated or the dot. It doesn't matter. Have a look at the paper yourselves and you'll know, okay? But here, if we look at isopropyl with terbutyl, for instance, one of these is the calculated rate constant that they would have calculated with the ab initio method. The other is using the geometric mean rule. And you can see, in a lot of the cases, the rate constants are very similar. And anyway, the, the range of the results here are, isn't huge. You know, they're still pretty close. And so what they found was that using the ge geometric mean rule, was a pretty good way of estimating the ray constant for the uh, cross reactions of the different species. So if you know the, the ray constant for the self recombination, you can then actually back out the ray constant of the, the combinations of different radicals with one another, okay? So that's another thing that, that can be used. Okay, another uh, reaction type is H atom abstraction from the fuel, okay, by, by radical species. So H, OH, HO2, and methyl. And H atoms can be abstracted from primary, secondary, or tertiary carbon atoms. The rate constant depends on the radical species that's doing the abstracting and the type of H atom being abstracted, being primary, secondary, or tertiary. So primary atoms have the strongest CH bond energies, 101.5 kilocalories per mole, and these are the most difficult to abstract, while tertiary H atoms are the weakest and they're more easily abstracted, okay? And you can observe that here in this table. So this is a table that my group published in 2006. And so these are H atom abstraction rate rules for alkanes, for abstraction by hydrogen atom, and this is for on a per H atom basis, OH, methyl, and HO2. And you can see, in most cases, actually, there's a strong temperature curvature. But even then, you can see, look, primary has, a high, has the highest activation energy, followed by secondary and tertiary. And you can see, as I said, for OH, the activation energy doesn't change very much, but it's still highest for the primary. Now, there's a bit strange here, but here we have a strong temperature curvature and an activation energy and one of these is compensating for the other. Here, the tertiary one has a less strong temperature curvature and a little bit positive activation energy. So it's hard to see there what's going on, okay? But you can see here for methyl, or even more clearly for um, high, uh, peroxy radical, that the activation energy for abstraction of a primary is highest then it's weaker for a secondary and weakest for a tertiary. And that's typically the trend that you see. Okay. But not only can you do it then for alkanes, this is a slide from uh, Pierre-Alexandre Glaude. Uh, he works with uh, Frédéric Batan-Leclerc in Nancy. 
And there you see that our, here he has a ray constants for abstraction of allylic. Here are these hydrogen atoms. So these would be um, alkane-like hydrogen atoms, these three. But these two are secondary allylic hydrogen atoms. This is a, a secondary vinylic hydrogen atom. And this is, these are primary vinylic hydrogen atoms. And you can actually have uh, tables of rate rules for abstraction of these types of atoms also. Okay. And if we put a methyl group here instead of this hydrogen atom, then this would be a tertiary uh, allylic hydrogen atom. Okay. If we remove the carbon here and made this a hydrogen atom, then these three hydrogens would be primary allylic hydrogen atoms. Okay. And so the rate rules would be slightly different depending on, on the This is, yes, yes, that's a typo. So I was asked, should that be primary and secondary vinylic in the columns here? And I think, I believe yes. Okay, because th these are primary vinylic, th these are secondary. I would say primary and secondary. Okay, now again, though, just, okay, so if we look then for abstraction of the different types of site, what is the rate constant for abstraction by the different, by H, OH, methyl, HO2, and O atom? And so this goes back maybe to the question that I was asked before I started today, which, which one is the most important? And it's not only the, it's not only rate, but it's the concentration of the radical that is being formed in the system that determines it. Because the rate is proportional to the both the rate constant and the concentration of the species. So it's both. Okay? But you can see here that H, O, and OH are the three most reactive. HO2 and CH3 are far less reactive, okay? But HO2 is important because if we react HO2, we get hydrogen peroxide, and then we get two OHs, and OH is up there near the top, okay? So it does have some importance. So typically, we don't see, and for straight-changed alkanes in particular, we don't see big sensitivity to methyl radicals. However, we do for the branch-chained ones, and it's obvious because for the branch-chained ones, it's branched, we have methyl groups on them, and then we get uh, higher concentrations of methyl radical, and then they do become important. Right? So O radical is also very reactive. Um, it's here, but usually it's produced in small concentrations. HO2 is le notably less reactive, but leads to H2O2, which composes into two OH radicals. Okay, so H atom abstraction then by OH radicals, because at low temperature, and even at intermediate temperatures, OH radicals are very important. So on a per H atom basis, actually, at low temperatures, tertiary, the rate of tertiary abstraction is highest, then secondary, and then primary. And then, so you can see here, if we're going to abstract from an alkane, such as uh, propane or butane or pentane, that the rate of abstraction of the secondary is going to be faster than primary, okay, on a per H atom basis. But actually, if we look at the per C site basis then, still secondary is fastest, it's, they're about the same at the lowest temperature. And then primary overtakes the tertiary when you get above about 1,000 Kelvin. But secondary tends to dominate. OK. Now, not only do you look at the site. And so let's look at, uh, this is propane. We have the molecule here, and we have an in-plane primary, and we have two out-of-plane primary hydrogen atoms. Here we have secondary hydrogen atoms, and here we have primary hydrogen atoms again. So 
these hydrogen atoms are on a secondary hydrogen atom which are bonded to no other secondaries. So we have S00, okay? They're just bonded, the carbon atom is bonded to just primary carbons, okay? So it's S00. So not only you can get really, really down to the finer details, and so if you look at this paper by Sivar Amarkrishnahan and Joe Michael and Stephen Klippenstein at Argonne, they looked at and studied the ray constant for H atom abstraction, both experimentally and computationally. Um, and by looking at uh, developing rate rules for abstraction of various different types of hydrogen atoms in a molecule. So not only primary, secondary, and tertiary, but down to the finer details. Here we have an S01. Here we have an S11. So here, now, this carbon atom is bonded to one other secondary carbon atom and a primary. So this is an S01. This carbon atom is bonded to two other secondary carbon atoms, so it's an S11. Okay? And then there's a different ray constant for abstraction at the different sites. Slightly different. They're not hugely different. Okay? So you can even get to that level of detail in terms of the ray constant for abstraction. Now, I'm sure the same is true for abstraction by H, O, methyl, and so on, and HO2. But by and large, apart from HO2, particularly at the lower temperatures, they're not important. Okay? And at the higher temperatures, the slight differences in the activation energies won't make a big difference. Okay? So really, what we really need to worry about for these nuances in slight activation energy differences and so on would be at the lower temperatures uh, for OH and HO2. Okay? And now, this has implications as well. So if we go back and, or sorry, if we just look, we're, I was talking here about you know, which is fastest, which dominates, is it secondary, is it tertiary, is it primary? It has uh, nuances then in how the chemistry proceeds because the rate of abstraction by primary or secondary, and if you can think of a large alkane molecule, and if you have this nuance of an, an S00 or an S01 or an S11, the rate constant is going to be slightly different for each one. And then we're going to get slightly different concentrations of the radicals that are formed from that. And then you'll get a slightly di different distribution of product species ultimately formed in the process. It'll lead to slightly different predictions of the mechanism in reactivity, and also slightly different predictions of the mechanism in terms of the product species that are produced in the process. Okay? And so, Hence, it's really valuable for studies to measure speciation profiles in jet stirred reactors and flow reactors at these temperatures and also ignition delay times so that it will really help uh, refine the chemistry and validate the mechanisms. All right. Um, okay, I'll, just, I'll finish out the, the, this um, reaction type and then we'll go on to bed decision reactions after this. Okay. Now, so for, I would say, and, and, and it's fortunate really, because fuel, or OH radical, is very important at low and intermediate temperatures, right? But another radical that's very important at intermediate temperatures, as I've been going on about, is HO2. For OH, it's easy, or, I showed you um, a couple of days ago where uh, Professor Hansen's group at Stanford and others can measure the rates of reaction of OH with fuel that can be done using that Leibs or absorption technique, techniques. Okay, so, and they have been measured now, and also uh, Professor Amir Farouk at Kaust, who was a previous student of um, Professor Hansen's, also has been measuring the, these ray constants of fuel plus OH. And also there have been some detailed calculations of, of them, as I've shown you in the Sivaram or Krishnahan work. However, 
for fuel plus HO2, HO2 is very difficult to measure. Now, they're here at Stanford, Professor Iguang Zhu, and in Nancy, um, um, Professor Fitchen and Frederic Badan Le Clerc have been looking at uh, measuring HO2 uh, radical concentrations. And we will be, I think in the next couple of years, people will be able to measure the rates of fuel plus HO2. But to date, that hasn't been done. And I think it's a very important thing for the community to be able to do, is to measure these rate constants. Okay? So, and as you see, as you've seen, it's a very important radical at intermediate temperatures. And the, if, you, if you look, I haven't got the exact references, but there was a paper published um, by my group, well, in collaboration with um, Wim Plopper's group at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and Jorge Aguilera in Parlaria was the lead author on that, where we looked at different alkanes plus HO2. And also, a similar work was performed around the same time by Heinz Heinrich Karstensen and Tony Dean at the Colorado School of Mines. And they published a paper in 2008, seven, sorry, we published ours in 2008. And the calculations, though, using these ab initio calculations didn't agree with one another. And our rate constants are slower uh, in comparison to those calculated by the Colorado School of Mines. Okay? And you can see here the rate constant for primary, secondary, and tertiary are, that we calculate are always slower than those by the Colorado School of Mines. But you can see also that primary is always slower compared to secondary and tertiary. Okay? And that's what you'd expect based on the bond association energy of the hydrogen atom that you're abstracting. Okay. This is just showing you, though, uh, here's propane plus HO2 um, giving you isopropyl plus H2O2. There was some work um, by Baldwin and Baldwin and Walker studied a lot of these types, types of reactions. And here's just one point. Typically, the study is about 753 Kelvin in a closed reactor. And you can see that uh, our calculations are, for the secondary are closer to that uh, measured by Baldwin and Walker and um, ones that are, we have been using, okay? I think that these are closer to the truth, but we don't know. The truth is we don't know, okay? But these are the ones that we use, okay, in our mechanisms, okay? And we, we, this is one thing, the area in the community, which would be very valuable if these uh, could be measured uh, experimentally, okay? If we use, if we look at just our example molecule, 2-methylheptane, here's, here's our experimental results at a equivalence ratio of 1 in air at 20 atmospheres, and here's the model prediction using the rate, the rate constants in the mechanism that uh, we recommend, the slower ones. But if you use the rate constant from the Colorado School of Mines, you can see at lower temperatures, there's no difference in prediction. But at intermediate temperatures, there's a substantial improvement in prediction because the rate constants are higher. But what the slide also goes to show is the region of importance of HO2 chemistry. Okay? And this is telling you at this condition, 20 atmospheres, that it's important here from about 750 up to 1200 Kelvin. Okay? And I think that's a pretty good place to take a break. <laughs>